Hey, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us here at APA Days New York. Hopefully everyone's having an amazing time. Uh, I'm Melissa Knight. I'm going to be your MC for this morning on the API security track. We have some amazing speakers lined up for you today. So sit back, relax, grab a cup of joe, and join me as I introduce an amazing speaker here. Uh, JB Aviat from Datadog is going to be talking about uh, API observability, which is, I'm sure many of you know, is an incredibly important topic. Uh, I'm a big believer in you can't protect what you don't know you have. So I'm really excited to see JB's uh, presentation. I hate it when people introduce me and talk about my bio uh, because no one, <laughs> no one knows me better than I know myself. So I'm not going to insult JB and and uh, introduce him uh, for him. So uh, without further ado, um, everyone have a great time. And uh, JB, you've got the microphone, buddy. Thank you, Alisa. Amazing intro. <laughs> nice to meet you, everyone. Um, so as Alisa announced, let's talk about um, API security and observability. So I'd like to start with my small intro. Uh, so I'm a Datadog uh, AppSec engineer. I was a Screen CTO and co-founder. Um, Screen got acquired by Datadog in uh, 2021, uh, six months ago. I'm a former uh, Apple uh, Red Teamer, doing a lot of reverse engineering and internal systems, was a pen tester, uh, and I'm also the host of the AppSec Builders podcast. Feel free to, to take a look. But let's Let's dive in. So if we were in a, in a physical room, I, I would uh, ask you to shoot out loud, what do you think this is? So feel free to, uh, to, to take a guess in the, in the comments here, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a hint. Uh, that's the world life expectancy. And it was multiplied by 2.4 in 150 years. Right, so you read that correctly. In like 150 years ago, uh, your average age of death would be under 30 years old, and now it's over 72 years. So um, that's uh, an amazing progression that we had over uh, over the years. If we if we take a look at what medicine looked in the in the past, well, we had very very little tooling, very little knowledge processes. And so, yeah, that, that was that was some guess. And some say, yes, medicine looks a bit like astrology. I don't know what you think about astrology, but I'm not um, I'm not a firm believer in that kind of science. Right. So what what changed? What happened in, uh, in 150 years to 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 make this broad and amazing change? Well, a lot of different techniques have been have been discovered, right? Uh, microbiology, ECG, X-ray, radiotherapy, blood transfer, um, CT scan, ECG, and that's only naming a few, right? Um, and that's not enough. Uh, that's a lot of amazing innovations that helped us save several lives, and I think you all uh, are many of those things we, we have benefited from, uh, I did. Um, and that's uh, nothing if we don't have everything that we need around it to use it, like doctors that should be trained to use that, um, practitioners that have uh, perfect tools to help them uh, use it. And so beside those tools, we actually need context and, and uh, algorithm tools to actually use them efficiently. So for instance, um, you need to correlate the results of uh, the observability that you benefit from an X-ray or, or a CT scan, and you need to turn that into, into an algorithm. And so my, my mom suffered last year from um, macrocytic anemia, and, and that's those kind of things that the doctor used to, to help her go, uh, go through that. And so that's thanks to that kind of tools and the compound of the tooling and the algorithm and the, the practitioner's knowledge that we can improve uh, life expectancy. And now today, medicine students, they all have statistical classes because that's a very important part of how you do medicine today. 
And so this progress came from those two things, really, the ability to collect data, to exploit it, and to make it usable by the, by the practitioners. So how can we translate that to, to security? Obviously, the context is not exactly the same, right? Defining a, a metric to evaluate security success uh, that would be similar to world life expectancy is not trivial. And for instance, if today you look at the count of observed breaches or the count of malicious groups, everything is rising. Uh, you, you see in the headlines, uh, uh, crypto uh, uh, here, um, ransomware there, uh, open database uh, at this place. Um, so yeah, everything is, is, a lot of bad signals are rising. But on the other hand, all of our tools, our observability methods, our uh, developments, best practices, everything is improving. So um, we are in a context uh, where things are getting um, much better for, for security. And so we have data from everywhere, right? Uh, we have hundreds of vendors over the world that will all help you either um, get a very precise observation of one slice of technology or maybe uh, do some part of your tooling. But what we want, is actually to use data from everywhere. And I said not, not only left, because you, you all know the adage, shift security left. Shifting left is important, but actually you don't want to shift. You, you, you want indeed to have more proactive security. But if you take this analogy to medicine, the information you need to gather, you need to get it from every step of your software development life cycle, from design, conception, to test, release, deploy. And of course, you also want to monitor your production, right? Having only left is, is, would be ridiculous. But left is very important because knowing whether a part of your um, software was tested or designed securely is extremely important. So what, what do we actually need in terms of data? Obviously, our security resources are scarce, right? would be very hard to say, okay, let's uh, instrument every part of the, of the build process or of the production or, or, or whatever. On top of that, those resources, uh, they are spread thin, right? Because monitoring the production, helping the developers design secure systems, keep up with the business needs and changing priorities, um, that's, that's crazy complex. And all of the systems that we are working with are also becoming much more complex. So security products have to make the life of security folks easier and help them focus on what matters. So let's assume that we have uh, a tool that help us prioritize things efficiently. So let's assume that that screen is your API. Okay, so on the left, we have 100% of API traffic. And so what we want is to get relevant security information without false positives, and we want to resurface the threats, right? So let's take a very naive approach to surfacing important security information here, okay? So what if I do like a typical regular web application firewall and so maybe I'm down to 1% of my requests, right? And I will only record the requests that are matching an attack pattern. Then on those attacks, I can filter out the ones that do not target an existing route because that's like garbage traffic. And then I only want the attack targeting what the code is doing. Okay, uh, if, if, if you don't know something interesting on my source code, I don't want to, I don't want to know. And last but not least, maybe you want only the attacks on known edge services because we know that the edge services are usually full of uh, random internet traffic. Okay, that would be a, a good way to, 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 to prioritize and filter out the, the attacks you don't want to see. Um, so that's pretty easy to do, right? Um, getting information about whether something's a real API endpoint or not, well, uh, you can query the framework. You all have this information available right here. 
But uh, knowing if the attack is superficial or not, any modern um, distributed tracing system will tell you that, right? The location of your service and where is it lying in the attack uh, traces. Obviously, if you want to know that uh, the attack API actually performs like some database, for instance, Cassandra query, well, you have this information in your trace. Um, so you get a lot of information. You can tell, okay, this attack that was about databases is targeting a request that is actually using a database. So that's something that is, that is very important to know. And so what about detecting a NoSQL injection that is stealing user credentials? Good, so this observability exists. It's possible. It's in our tools, right? And so if we think about all the kind of data that we can gather with similar things, well, it looks like the crazy amount of observability that we managed to gather from the human body in those past 150 years. So can we take this to the next level? Instead of a dozen data points, well, we could gather hundreds automatically from your production environments because your ops, your SREs, your developers, they are all instrumenting and monitoring their production at a level that sometimes you would not expect because those are not security tools. Those are ops, SRE, and developer tools. But those tools, they have a level of precision that is unprecedented. And so we start to have the kind of data that we would need here. Let's take some other examples, right? So what kind of information can I tie to a request? A lot, a lot. For instance, does the request IP as non-threat intelligence? Maybe it does, maybe, maybe it doesn't. I can know, for instance, that a request um, trace was unusual or the performance was unusual. Maybe it was authenticated. Maybe it triggered an uh, indicator of compromission on the, on the host. Or maybe that request reached some code that was never tested by my, by my developers. And so I could categorize each request with this kind of information. Okay, good. Uh, but request uh, level thing feels a bit uh, like, uh, like, the, like the 90s, right? So um, we can also correlate things regarding actors. For instance, a given IP has done a lot of suspicious requests or maybe a given user uh, just changed country or is coming from a data center. Yes, that would be unusual for, for, for a user. Okay, so that's a different kind of information. That's a different angle that we have here, but that's also very um, insightful. And so we could also look at the service, right? Um, so what do we know about services? I don't know, are they exposed to the internet? Are they performing authentication or not? How large is their code base? Are they using outdated frameworks? Do they lack security best practices? Are they running on a host that has indicators of compromise? Um, is that using sensitive databases, exposed databases? So that's a lot of information that we can um, gather from every part of your engineering organization. It's not only your production, right? It's also information about the developer's team uh, who's on call. Um, was this service paged a lot in the past month or is it something that is very stable? Was it deployed recently or not? And so we can compound those information, right? And so that provides the true view about the security context of an API. Is it currently in danger or not? And so if we combine those precise measurements with statistical analysis and the right tooling, then it will provide the most complete view in order to monitor those production systems. So that's holistic and cut level API observability. What's beyond? So remember what we want to do is to shift everywhere, right? So here, all the examples 
I give her only on a subset of that operate plus monitor. We mentioned a bit of test. We mentioned a bit of deploy. But if you plug also everything that is left, like the planification system was this system under a careful design uh, review with the security team or with a proper threat model performed, would the code performed by senior developers or young developers? Are those developers um, aware of security best practices or do they have a history of putting security holes in our uh, software? Compounding all of that information can really provide this holistic vision of your systems and, and help you understand what is happening on, um, on, your, on your systems. So what's the future like? Obviously, we want to improve the security data collection. The goal is to make it simple. Instrumenting manually all of those systems would take years and would not be a, a realistic project. But most security teams today, they benefit from the tools that the developer and the SRE team have put in place for themselves. All tracing, distributed tracing, whole exception monitoring, whole uh, log analysis systems, all of that is used by SREs and developers to maintain their systems. So we just need to use that further and further. We need to improve the correlation over this data, is that trace related to uh, synthetic tests that failed, um, to a peak of log, to a CI failure? And this correlation, all of this context, we need to correlate it. So across um, several data sources. And then we need to make that available to practitioners. Going beyond the CM. Working on flat logs is outdated, right? It's, there is no way you can correlate efficiently data using simple flat log files. What you need is something with context, some rich events. We are in uh, 2021st, right? Uh, using flat text uh, to describe events feels a bit outdated. Now that's how most CM are working today. And so if you think about traces, attacks, the operating system behaviors, the errors, the vulnerability, and whatever you can think of correlated in one single platform, that's how we can start to have something that is similar to medicine. That's the path we are following today. I see more and more um, security platforms taking this approach. The difficulty is always managing to gather relevant events in a realistic fashion without asking years of work to the, to the developer's team. But we are following this path. And I believe that um, security will soon follow a path similar to medicine. We will have much better tooling and the evolution is exponential. So that would be my, my takeaway, right? Security is evolving, but we still need a lot more data and a lot more tools that will help us correlate that. You don't want to only shift left, you want to shift everywhere. Each piece of information is critical. So you want to leverage observability from your engineering organization to improve the security monitoring, the production, the software development life cycle, and everything that you may have handy. This data needs to be correlated using rich and coherent sources rather than flat and disparate. Thank you. Would you have any questions? That was an awesome presentation, JB. This is actually a very interesting topic, uh, especially for me as an API hacker. You know, this for me, and I've always believed that you know observability is is so critical. Like I said in the beginning, you, you know, you can't protect what you don't know you have. Um, we have some great questions that came in from the audience. Uh, so, in your own words. 
Can you summarize what AP observability is to you? Like, you know, it, 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 seems to, it seems to encompass so many things. If you were to explain AP observability to a layperson who, who didn't really fully understand it, how would you describe it? It depends if you are talking to developers, to an SRE, uh, to, or to a security person, right? Um, right. I think API observability would be uh, very depending on the on the context of your of your API. I think the best person right. uh, you should ask that would be your developers and your SRE, and uh, try to understand how uh, what kind of data they need when they face an outage, when they face a bug, and when they want to, to debug something. And usually when you have this level of information, that's what the security team needs as well. Because at some point when you are trying to understand where vulnerability came from or something that you found in a, in a, pest, in a pen test report or in a bug bounty report, you need to understand that precisely. And you need the same tools that they need in order to uh, to understand that. So observability uh, really means different things depending on the on the context of the API. Obviously, if you ask a, a business person as well, that would be very different as well. Sure. Yeah. They're, they're, each department or each each role is going to have different requirements from that uh, from that uh, that data for sure. It, it's it sounds like a lot of what you're saying is bridging DevOps and security with de, you know with DevSecOps and making sure that um, you know both audiences are getting what they need from it. So you mentioned that systems are becoming more complex. Do you think that this complexity is what's leading to a lot of the vulnerabilities that we're seeing in APIs today? Um, that's that's a good question. Um, s- s- complexity and, and security uh, are not. Uh, uh, we cannot say they are friends, but they are also not correlated, mm-hmm. right? You, you can have very complex uh, systems that are very well designed and uh, can be operated in a in a secure way. And the complexity is uh, is required because uh, yes, we are building more and more things from an an IT uh, standpoint. But um, the good thing is that if you take a monolith that was uh, here uh, 20 years ago, now it's split into smaller systems. So can we say that the overall is more complex? Well, I don't know because sometimes from a business standpoint, it does the same thing, just instead of being uh, hundreds of One big monolithic application, yeah. Yes, it's some similar. So yes, you need a different tools and mindset to be able to debug it. You need to talk to 10 teams rather than talking to one team. But if the thing is designed properly, you have nice interfaces and you can more easily neuro and scope your thing. But obviously, microservices are already like, what, 10, 15 years old. And the tools right. <laughs> that allow you to monitor them at scale, they feel much younger, right? And so it's, yeah. it's only recently that you have performant things and that uh, CNCF put uh, open tracing, open telemetry and everything. So um, there is always some lag behind the latest best practices and what the industry is capable to, to, to offer. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm what this other, uh, this other question that came in is in regards to context and security. And you touched on a lot of that in your presentation uh, what's your opinion on the importance of that? As far as I, I think, basically, what they're wanting to know is, you know, the the different. What's the difference between context and security and no context, and and how yes. does that affect, you know, the detection and response to API attacks? So it's uh, context is uh, is everything. If you if you think, uh, I'm going to take a simple analogy, but um, 20 years ago, if you want to observe. Uh, the performance of your API. What did you do? You were at the load balancer level, at the router level, and you were looking at the number of milliseconds that one given request was taking to complete, right? That was 20 years ago. And so if you have a slowdown, what do you do? You know it's slow, that's good, because you you know there is a problem, but you have no clue where the problem is lying. Today, if you take any APM, they will obviously tell you that there is a slowdown, but they will break it down. And you will see that that database or that service is responsible for that that issue. And so this is context. You don't have a single information with just the number of milliseconds. You get something enriched where you know what is the path that this request took, and you know what element slow it down. And so all 
of that is context. If we bring that with security, it's very similar. Instead of having like a raw log of this HTTP request matched a regular expression. So maybe something has been exploited or not, you don't know because you don't know what's happening behind. If you can correlate that with the context of that actual request execution, knowing that, mm, yes, there were a database, this database call contains uh, user statements, so there is, there is actually an issue. Or this uh, request actually performed uh, an HTTP request on an internal service that is usually not used. Yes, that looks like a SSRF. Um, the context allows you to get that. So context is everything, and that's how we manage and we start to have some security tools that do no false positive, thanks to that context. Yeah, awesome. JB, this was a great presentation. Thank you so much for the information that you provided on this important topic. Thank you all of you for the great questions. Uh, JB, um, you have a great rest of your day. Thank you for presenting at uh, API Days New York. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you so much, Alisa. Have a great day. Thank you, JB.